the Lord Church to stand to our feet this evening. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for another day to be in your presence and in your house, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're so great and wonderful. Yes, you are, Jesus.
I, Pastor, has given me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to be doing a five-minute little warm-up welcome. But everyone, you may be seated. And right now, I want you guys to think of the most peaceful thing in the world that you can do that just brings you peace. Do your own thing. <laughs> And if you could turn in your Bibles to Mark 4, 439. If you're there, say amen. If you're not, say oh me. No, I'm just kidding. Don't tattle on yourselves. Uh, Mark 4, 39. All right, I'll get there. All right. <laughs> All right. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. In this story and in this scripture, the disciples were on a boat, and Jesus was asleep. We've all heard it. And the storm is raging. There's fear. There's what's going on. God, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Hello. And he, w he gets up and he rebukes the storm with three words. Peace, be still. I know there's been situations in our lives and we let it pile up and pile up and we get our anger in the way and our frustrations in the way. And we're like, when do we get a break? When do we get a moment? And the thing is, is that those same feelings that come into our lives, that anger, that unsteadiness, that fear, is a reason we're not getting a break. I don't believe when Jesus said peace, he wasn't just talking to the sea, he was talking to the atmosphere. And when he said, be still, is when it moved. When we're in our moments and in our trials and in our way and we are not having a peaceful moment, how on earth are we going to hear God? If we can't step away and take a second and be like, okay, okay. In those moments where we have to be at a peace just to hear him. Because when our anger, our anxieties, our depressions, our sorrows, our friends hurting, someone else is in need. What about me? When do I get a break? If we let those voices get louder than God's, how can he talk to us? When we need peace in the situation. God's already gifted us peace. It's, willing, it's up to us that we keep asking and receiving it. We're human. We're going to feel every stinking emotion, sadly. <laughs> we're going to feel those painful moments, and we're going to want to react, and we're going to want to take charge. And we can't. My mo the, mo the times I'm at peace the most, and when I find it super easy to talk to God, for me, some people think it's crazy, but on horseback. I'm at a complete peace. That's a moment when God can speak to me without anything in my way. Having a prayer room and a closet, yes, that is awesome and it does bring peace. But sometimes there's one thing we need just to sit down, relax, and sit still. God had to make the atmosphere peaceful so that we could be still and listen. Right now, I want you guys to think about your most, the most peaceful thing you could do. And I want you guys to put into the situation the emotions you felt before. Was it taking a vacation? You needed to get a break from work. Stressful things at work, stressful things at home build up. A prayer closet, a prayer room where you can be like, God, I just need peace. It will come. 
He's a God of love. He's a God that gives unconditionally. He's waiting for you to call. He was asleep. Not really, but yes, he was taking a nap. But he was waiting for them to respond. He was waiting for them to call. We all know God could have stopped it instantly without them calling. But he said, I need you to call me. When your situation's at its hardest, he's like, I need you to call me. I can't intervene. I need you to call me. Because then it's personal. That's how relationships work. It's not just a one on one side, oh, they'll take care of it. I'm going to go do what I want. No, it's like, hey, what do you need from me? Okay, okay. And we're going we're gonna to have this. Com- All right. You've done so much. Let me do a little and just call. Just call. Bring peace into the storm and in the situation. That's all we have to ask. And once we're in this peaceful moment, then you better be quiet and listen. Because God's got something to say. It's not all about your situations and problems. God's like, I'm trying to answer you, but you won't be quiet. I've brought peace. Now sit still. It's my turn to do the work. It's not your job to hold on to the negative emotions. It's not your job to hold on to the burdens anymore. I've put peace. Now let me do my job. Stop stepping in when God's already promised you a victory. Stop worrying when God's already promised you that victory. God's not done with your situation. He's working in it. I don't know, I only have so much time. But 2 Peter 1 and 3. Here, I have it here. I'm cheating a little bit and using my phone, but that's fine. <laughs> but 2 Peter 1 and 3. According to his divine power hath given unto all of it, all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. according to his divine power, hath, hath given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness. He's given it to us. Claim it. Don't interfere. You want to find peace? You can find it in a church pew. You can find it in a prayer room. You can find it in your prayer closet. You can find it reading the word. I can find it on horseback. Some people find it in a deer stand. But God is saying, be still and listen. I'm ready to fix the situation. Step aside. Right now, if we can all stand and just pray, God, help me find the peaceful moments so that I can be still and listen. God, help me find those moments in my prayer closet. God, help me find those moments in life when I am frustrated and angry and I can't hear your voice because my voices are louder. God, allow me to have that peaceful moment where I can hear you. God, allow me to have that peaceful moment so that I can reach out and do the little things you ask of me. God, help me to call out to you when I need you. God, help me to find you when I need you so that I'm not the one putting me down. But God, you are here to lift me up. You are here to bring peace into my situation. God, help me to have faith and to believe and be restored. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord tonight. Amen. Thank you, Sister Shailen. Thank you, Lord, for the word tonight. We appreciate you. Thank you for the peace that you can give. Peace that passes all understanding. We appreciate that tonight. We're grateful, Lord. We're grateful. Help us to be still in the midst of chaos and storms and to, Lord, seek that peace that only you can bring. Amen. Amen. Everybody said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sis, for that good word this, this evening. I almost said this morning. 
That's what happens when you miss one Sunday, right? And it's good to be back home. Uh, thank you for allowing us to uh, slip away um, this weekend. It was a wonderful service that you all had this weekend. Thank God for such a beautiful uh, word from the Lord. Brother Chavis did a great job, and um, it's just good to have him. Great service. My, I was with my um, my pastor. They did a birthday celebration for him, asked me to come, and I hadn't been back in many years, and so I, I needed to go, and so it was just uh, a great time, but we did miss you, but it's good to be back home, good to have the DeWitts back home. Uh, seemed like we were all gone, yeah, but we're back. Amen. It's good to have Brother Jared Reyes back with us here tonight on loan from uh, Uncle Sam. And, uh, and of course, Sister Sarah, this is uh, Sister Kim's mother. We honor her. Glad to have her back with us tonight. And uh, amen. It's good to have Will with us tonight and others that may be visiting. If I missed you, I apologize. Thank you for being here tonight. Praise God. Amen. You know what I think we ought to do? I think we ought to pray specifically before I go to the word of the Lord for some needs. I know there's many needs, sickness. Um, my mother, they just uh, gave her a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. They're uh, looking at options now. And of course, that's, a, that's something nobody wants to hear. So keep her in, in prayer. Brother Jonathan's father is not doing real well. Let's remember him, my wife's mother. Um, and I know that there are many others. Uh, Kathy Dorr had surgery. Christopher Thatch is in, this is Sister Donna's son. He has been in the hospital for months in <clears throat> San Antonio, Texas, and um, El Paso before that. Needs prayer. Uh, many others need prayer. Just lift your hands if you know a, a, a prayer need that I'm, I know I'm probably m missing some. But God knows. Amen. And God not only knows about it, he knows how to fix it. He knows how to comfort our hearts and give you peace. Amen. Lord, in Jesus' name, I pray for every need that is here tonight. Of the, Those made known by the lifting of the hand. Those, Lord, that are uh, here tonight. Those that are watching at home. I know that you can move and you can touch and minister in a powerful way. And I ask you to do that right now. Things that we can't fix, Lord, I know that you can fix. We pray that we would take Brother Chase's message to heart, Lord, and get closer to you tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you for it, Lord. We thank you for your power. Thank you for your care for us, for your compassion. We pray for those, Lord, that are not here tonight for various reasons. We pray you would touch them, be with them, Lord. Bless our service this weekend. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing, and we appreciate you. And we give you glory and praise. Bless this Bible study tonight. Let the word of God touch our hearts and illuminate our minds, our spirit. And help us, Lord, to be motivated to help our fellow man, Lord, to reach out and to love others, lift others. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Can we give the Lord a hand of praise tonight? Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for being here tonight. We are glad to see all of you here. Uh, just a quick couple of things before I get into the Word. If you uh, would like to participate in giving to the, for the gift baskets, we're giving gift baskets to some of our homebound seniors um, here in the next little bit. We do need those items in by Sunday. See Sister Mary Vincent. There's a sign-up sheet out on the welcome desk. If you'd like to go by and see some things you could bring, uh, your little items, that would be a blessing to let some of our homebound seniors know that we care for them. Um, or you can see Sister Mary Vincent. You can see Brian Vincent if you are a man and you'd like to go to men's conference. See Brian Vincent. That's coming up mid-September if anyone would like to go. Uh, you can see him. And one last thing. Um, in September, we are excited about what we're calling fall breakouts, and uh, we are going to be having three classes at three different locations with three different instructors, and uh, we will continue to have our youth class and our kids class, but three adult classes, so you can, you can take your choice, but I'm not telling you what they are tonight. 
I will tell you this. There's going to be snacks involved. Hallelujah. This is going to be awesome. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Amen. And you, you can bring your own drink. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, each class is going to have snacks for you, but rather than try to get everything situated for everybody because one likes coffee, one likes tea, and one likes all frou-frou stuff. And all. So just bring you a little whatever you want to bring. How about that? And then we'll have the snacks for you. So that's kind of the plan. Then I'll tell you a little bit more as we go along. And I'm just uh, here the next little bit giving you a little bit of insight. We actually know exactly what we're doing, but I'm just not telling you all of it yet. <clears throat> One of the few times we kind of know what we're doing. But anyway, we're excited about that. It's going to be fun. Amen. Praise God. What a great vacation Bible school we just finished. That was wonderful. Had a great crowd, a lot of kids, and uh, it was exciting. And um, there's good stuff happening. We've baptized several the last few weeks. Uh, I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, someone received the Spirit Sunday, and that's just wonderful. And it was a powerful service. I'm thankful for that. Amen. Tonight, <clears throat> I'm going to be diving into our uh, Bible study here. And it's no secret, you probably have your hand out there. Um, I am going to be talking about on the subject, take care. Take care. Take care. That's like when somebody is at your house and they're leaving and, you know, you say, well, we'll see you later. Y'all take care. Well, there's a little bit more to that phrase. And maybe we can talk a little bit about care tonight. I want to read from Luke chapter 10. You can remain seated. Just let me read you the parable uh, of the Good Samaritan here. Luke 10, and we'll start at verse 30. Just read a few scriptures here. And this is the King James Version, Luke 10 and 30. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. Oh, yea, a priest is coming. Surely help is on the way, right? And he passed by on the other side. I mean, it's, he literally pointed out that the priest passed by on the other side. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came, looked at him, and went to the other side of the street and passed by. This is not a good example for the ministry right here in this story, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Now, the Samaritans were not necessarily religious uh, people. In fact, the Jews of that time and the Samaritans, they couldn't get along. The Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, brought him to an inn. And notice this last phrase here, took care of him. And he took care of him. And then on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and, and gave him to the host and said, take care of him. Take care. Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Amen. Care. Everybody say care. Care, care is a multi-billion dollar business. Rises, recent inflation in health care costs no longer shock us. Now we pay monthly for all kinds of anticipated care things. Legal care, child care, elder care, hair care, eye care, lawn care, pet care, car care, environmental care, all kinds of care. You name it, and we're all probably familiar with these kinds of words. In, in the insurance industry alone, you have intensive care, long-term care, and adjectives like superior and comprehensive make care more appealing. It's really a a wonderful, caring world as long as you got the money to pay for it, right? <laughs> caring used to be the expression of basic human concern, um, and it should be. People 
should care without the thought of payback. Seem like, uh, and I know we still do, but it does seem that there are other things involved. Um, you know, we used to care more about maybe family members, relationships, causes, institutions, ideas, uh, because they're vital uh, to our way of life. And we still do, but for sure, care can be springboarded into exploitation rather than genuine concern and care and compassion. And in, in a sense, care and compassion has been hijacked by various causes and maybe agendas for political gain or whatever that the case may be. But care is really not the government's business. It's really not somebody else's business. It's our business. It's, let, let's not forget that it was the church who started orphanage, orphanage children's homes. Whew, I cannot say it, saved my life. And <clears throat> It was the church that started soup kitchens, and it was the church that started homeless shelters. And in fact, it was the office of deacons started by the church in the book of Acts to make sure that no one was doing without. So maybe if the church was doing like it needed to be doing, then you know we wouldn't have to rely and depend and fight over so many other programs in our world and, and especially in our government. When you hear I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you better run. But if the church would show up and help and have that spirit of care that really we should have, then I think that's a different story. Amen. The United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, homelessness excuse me, uh, not homeliness, that's a whole other institution. But anyway, <clears throat> I missed one Sunday. I can't even read anymore. Homelessness, this big agency promotes their cause by saying this, and this is their statement. No one should experience homelessness. No one should be without a safe, stable place to call home. And so the need that we have to actually say that is probably a description of how crazy our world and our culture has become. At one time, families were the primary source of care. Home sweet home was where you could count on a hot meal and a warm bed and clean clothes and a bunch of family members, you know, hovering over you. But it's a different world today, um, you know, with the quote, modern family in the 21st century. And, and we've got a lot of wonderful things going. But at the same hand, home is not always an option for everybody in our world. And, and so, and, and I don't say this to, to, to be negative or, or anything like that, but it's just the facts. The reason that I say it is to, to share this point. There's never been a day that's more important for the church to show people that we care. There's never been a better day for us to care. I believe that more and more people are looking to the church. And I believe that the church, I believe Solid Rock Church, is a place of salvation and truth and help and hope. And it must be a place where we still care about people. Amen. There's an old adage, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that is true. But I can tell you, in our world today, there is so much needs everywhere that if we're not careful, we can develop care fatigue or compassion fatigue. I mean, you know, I, I, there have been times, um, I mean, there are just so many needs in the world. I mean, I'm always sharing needs about this or that. And sometimes we just get overloaded with it. So care takes effort. In fact, I've actually asked God at times, I said, God, increase my capacity to care. I know that may shock you um, today. Not that 
It's not that I don't care. I just don't care. <laughs> if anybody besides me would be honest tonight, you get what I'm saying. And, and you could say, yeah, there probably are times when uh, you, you, you work and you do and you give and you care and then people either yell at you anyway or just simply allow sin. It, you know, the whole thing is it's not people so much as the, the sin and, and the carnality in their life that have misguided them. Maybe they've misused your good deed. There's an old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. And maybe that's all happened. And so if we are not careful, we can have care fatigue. So it takes a little effort to maintain just to care about people, to care about ourselves, to care about life, etc. But can I tell you, church, and I feel to tell us and to remind us tonight that caring is one thing that we simply cannot afford to lose. When people say, I don't care anymore, that's a bad sign. That's how people devolve into self-harm and to other things that are terrible, even suicide, when they just don't care. We cannot afford to lose our care. Guess what? Somebody cared for you. Somebody cared for me. I think that care, compassion, and, and, and that just, just caring is the motivation, the desire to, to love in both word and deed is the driving force of the church in our world today. And so understand that some people's love language is language, you know, the goopy, mushy, love, kind words and sloppy kisses and lots of artistry and, you know, creative things, whatever. That's great. Then there are other people that actually, you know, it, their love is, 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 you know, taking over a, a meal and, and doing deeds. And maybe they're not so emotional, but they show love in practical ways. Can I tell you, all of that's valid. And we need a little of all of that. Amen. And I think tonight it's good for us to take inventory, if you will, of some of our caring practices. So the Good Samaritan, that's where I started. I think he modeled the caring mission of the Lord and by implication, the mission of the church. He, he came by upon the, the guy who had been beaten and left for dead and he knelt down in the mud. He um, he got messy uh, giving uh, initial care, and, and he didn't just leave it there, but he gave physical effort. He put him on his donkey, and then he took him to the inn, and he paid, gave out of his own pocket to uh, take care of this man that he didn't even know. And then he told the innkeeper, listen, uh, if it costs you more, then I want you to to take care of it, bill me when I get back. I'm going to tell you something. That's a dangerous thing to do. If, if the innkeeper was not a man of integrity, you know, he might be thinking, oh, I can think of all kinds of stuff this guy needs. But the guy wanted to take care of him. What an example. And so I, I think that we don't just fulfill our Christian duty uh, to, to others. Church, we don't do that just by explaining salvation. And just by teaching on the Godhead and, and just by witnessing and then walking away, I think we need to remember to truly care for people and to pray for people and to help in both word and in deed. Otherwise, we just become smug dispensers of doctrine. And we don't want to do that. We must care. The New Testament church must care. I'm telling you, we're in a world today where it almost makes you not care. You can have so much going that you just, and, and I understand, we have screens and news, things coming at us all the time, and there's so much, it's hard to take all of that into our spirit. That's why you need to shut it off sometimes and get with the Lord. But make no mistake about it, we need to care about the things of God. We need to care. We're going to talk a, bit, a, a little bit, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to care about several things here, but we have got to not lose our care. We've got to keep caring. Amen. Care means to feel concern or interest, to 
attach importance to something. And so let me just start in on this. Let me, let me list some things that the church should practice. You ready? Number one, it's in your handout. We must care for ourselves. I know, Pastor, you've been up there talking about caring for others, loving others. We have others Sunday once a month, but now you're talking about caring for yourself? Yes. Bible says in Galatians 6 and 5, every man must bear his own burden. How many has ever flown in an airplane? Most of us. When you get in that airplane, they give you a speech at the beginning, right? And they've got this, they, they talk about the vest in case you're over water and, you know, and, and they give you this speech. They say, well, if the airplane ever uh, loses oxygen, there'll be a mask that will drop. You place it over your head, you pull this and you breathe normally. And then they say, if you have a child with you, it's very important. You take care of yourself first. You breathe first and then you take care put the mask on the child, the tend to the child. And I, that's very interesting. It almost sounds selfish, but here's what they know from experience. If you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to take care of that baby. In fact, there's no way you can help if you can't breathe. I think that's important for us too. Not being selfish, but you gotta, if you're going to take care of others, you got to take care of yourself. In fact, you can better Take care of others when you properly take care of yourself. Amen. It's, it's important to do that. We should care about our, ourself. Uh, and let me just say this. It's not good for a Christian to neglect our personal welfare, to live irresponsibly, to become a parasite to society and 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 do all of these things if we are able to, to take care of ourselves. I understand that there are people that, that maybe are limited and can't do things, but we must do what we can do, right? We shouldn't expect others to do for us what we can do for ourselves. But at the same hand, we must do something for ourselves. We must take care. Um, so here we go. You, you need to care about your health because Jesus has got a work for you to do. So if you don't take your medicine, if you don't get some rest, if you, you know, don't uh, care about any, yourself, then, you know, I mean, we need you around as long as possible. And so do those things. Eat moderately. Move a little bit. And, and do the, I'm not, I'm not looking at anybody. I'm, I'm thinking about myself. But we need to do the, our part. Amen. And let the Lord do his part. We need to care about our appearance because we represent Christ to the world. And, and we need to care about that. We need to care about our attitude because people look at us and if we've always got a, you know, just a sour attitude and so forth, that's not a very good witness. Who wants a religion like that? You know, they got that already. They don't need any more of that. Your attitude is a roadmap of where you're going. So we need a good attitude. So again, if we don't care for ourselves, it's harder to care for others. Uh, now, again, this has to be in the proper perspective. You can take anything out of balance. You know, in other words, if all you care about is yourself, <laughs> then you're out of balance. You follow me? Everything has to be in balance, okay? But uh, certainly... In fact, self-care is a buzzword in today's world, and I do think that it is important, um, you know, to not disregard our own spiritual and mental and physical health, else it's harder to be a blessing to others. Number two, we must care for each other. We must care for each other. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, Galatians 6 and 2. Heard about a, um, a, a little girl and a, a little boy, there were br brother and sister, the little 11-year-old girl, 8-year-old brother, bickered and fought just over the slightest thing. And their father was surprised when the girl made an art artistic card for her brother's birthday. And inside she wrote, happy birthday to my 9-year-old brother. I'm so glad to have a brother to love. So God gave me you. 
And the dad said, oh, that's so sweet. And then he read the P.S. Don't read this out loud or I will twist your head off, she wrote. <laughs> so there you go. That's about the way brothers and sisters care. But we got to care. We are brothers and sisters. <laughs> Sometimes we want to twist one another's head off. <laughs> but we got to care for each other. And sometimes we do, you know, families, families, I'll just leave it there. I'll just say families, just shake my head. Sometimes that's the way it is. But guess what? We're a church family. And we got to love one another at the end of the day. Amen. Through all the irritations, misunderstandings, we must care deeply for one another. You know why? Because there's a world that is watching and it matters. Amen. Amen. We got to keep an eye on each other. Pay attention to telltale signs that indicate a brother or sister's having a, a tough time. Pray for one another. We talk about that and say that a lot, but it's important to pray for one another. And I, I remember when we were just at my home church recently, and it reminded me of so many things. I remember there was a gentleman we saw, dear friend, for many, many years when, when I was first. Um, Deployed to Desert Storm, Brother Jared. Um, I remember my daughter was about two years old, I think, when, not two years, two weeks old, sorry. Uh, my son was closer to that, but he would sometimes come up and slip a, shake my wife's hand, and inside there would be a little money to help. And I, I just can't tell, you don't forget that kind of stuff. You know, just, I'm not trying to, all, I'm, I'm not hinting or anything, but, you know, those are kind things, and it meant a lot. So we need to help one, one another. Send a card, speak a kind word, fix a meal, buy some groceries, run an errand, do a care basket, ask if there's something you can do, and mean it. Um, and, and sometimes we just got to imagine ourselves in a down-and-out situation and respond to someone like we would Appreciate being responded to. Philippians 2 verse 19 says, But I trust the, in the Lord to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. So he's saying, you know what? If we, if we are Jesus, then we should be not just seeking our own, but we should be blessing one another. Amen. Lou Gehrig was first baseman for the New York Yankees many years ago. He died on June the 2nd, 1941 of ALS, and that's why we call it Lou Gehrig's disease. The uh, doctors didn't really know about it back then. He was in the hospital for a long time. They experimented with different drugs. They were trying to find one that would work, and uh, it, was a, it was a terrible, long a struggle for him. But just before he died, Lou Gehrig called his friend Bob Considine. And he said, Bob, I got great news. The boys in the lab have come up with a new serum and they're trying it on 10 of us. And it seems to be working well on nine out of the 10. It's great. And Considine said, well, are you one of the 10, Lou? He said, well, no, but nine out of 10. Isn't that great odds? He was so excited that others were being blessed with this serum. And what a beautiful attitude. Perhaps that's why he's remembered fondly today because he cared about others. Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than ourselves. Amen. In other words, others. Be concerned about others. Number three, we must care for the church, the church. Ephesians 5 and 29, no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. We need to love the church, pray for the church, attend every service you're able to, support the church with giving, tithes and offerings, respond to initiatives led by the pastor, participate in activities sponsored by the church, strive to keep unity in the congregation, talk positively about the church, invite people to the church, minimize your criticism and maximize your compliments when you're talking about the church. That's caring for the church. 
Amen. Taking good care of the building. Watch out for the kids. Help a mom that's trying to herd her kids in the parking lot. Got sometimes carrying a diaper bag and Sunday school supplies and a kid on the other arm, you know. Whatever, help out. Maybe you, when you hear a prayer request, learn that somebody's having a difficult time. You know, pray for them. Let them know you're praying for them. Maybe write a card or whatever. Let them know. It's all that's important. Somebody's struggling. Uh, maybe they had a grief or a loss. Uh, you know, care. Care is very important. Care for your leadership. Be faithful in your duties. Whether it's, it doesn't matter if it's just cleaning a toilet or leading worship or greeting at the door, whatever that it is, caring for the church. That, that's practical things and ways that we can do that. So we have to, amen, be that kind of church. Say it, think it, do it, share it, protect its reputation, share its goals and support it, volunteer for it, pray for it, make it better because you're a part of it. Amen. Number four, number four, we must care for the faith. Faith is the backbone of the church. It's the structure. It's important. Jude three, verse three says, earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. I'm telling you, we have precious apostolic truths that need to be cherished and taught and practiced and handed down to the next generation. And uh, it's, it's not the day to, to set them aside, our doctrine, our, uh, our, our Bible knowledge, our lifestyle. We don't want to set all that aside. At the same hand, uh, we don't want to use that as weapons and sledgehammers and, you know, all of that. Uh, but the, the, the Word of God is a powerful, uh, we have wonderful revelations of truth that we can share with people who are hungry for truth. Thank God for the Word of God, for oneness, for uh, revelation of the Spirit, for revelation about baptism and Jesus' name and, and, and righteous living, the gifts of the Spirit, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, fellowship, love. A lot of people, they may not understand all of that. We've got doctrines that are important to us, and we can help share that. Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. In other places, the scripture says, don't be tossed around with every wind of doctrine, but love this truth. Love the doctrine. Settle it in your heart and care for the faith. Amen. Care for the faith. Number five, we must care for people who persecute us. Oh, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's a tough one. But you know, Jesus probably gave us the best example. As he was dying on the cross in the hands of his persecutors. Instead of calling angels down from heaven, instead of calling fire from heaven, I, I, I'm telling you, I would have been saying, Father, oh, I don't even want to say what I'm thinking right now, but I'm telling you, it would not have been forgive them. But yet, that's what Jesus wants me to do, and that's what I have to do, and I'm learning to do that through the Spirit that transforms me. Because Jesus reframes the past way of thinking into thinking new. The old man would have wanted them to fry like a meat skin, but the new man says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Amen. That's important that we, we care for people who mistreat us, people who've talked about us, people who've lied on us, people who, whatever. Just love them. Life's too short. Bitterness only destroys the container that it's kept in. Just let it go. Let it go. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. I want to read you just a few scriptures here. This is the uh, ESV, English Standard Version. I like this. It says this. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's good scripture. Number six. We must care for people who are different from us. Amen. Acts 15 and 9, I like this. It says, and put no difference. This was, they were discussing those that were still saying that Christians had to be circumcised. They had to be, hold all the Jewish traditions. And yet, that wasn't what God was teaching them, was what Paul was teaching them. And so he said, put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith, Acts 15 and 9. I think this is important. We're all God's children. Amen. And I I hope that you know, I'll say it again, I hope you know my strong desire to have, intentionally have a strong, multicultural, diverse, multigenerational, church. It's represented by every nation and ethnicity language. Every social status is welcome here. I hope that you know that. But also as a Christian, guess what? You are a stranger to this world. So while we're all different on the outside, guess what? You're different on the inside too from people who are not Christians. You know, you don't think like them, you don't act like them, you don't have the same customs, you don't have the same goals and desires when they want to go partying and getting drunk and go carousing because you are a Christian, I hope that you don't want to join them. (laughs) They may be using the, the, the Lord's name in vain and participating in various other deeds, but you know, You have been born again, and so you're trying to please God. I'm not saying we're perfect, but we're trying to please God. Uh, The Bible teaches that the old man glorified himself, but the new man glorifies God, and and on and on. So guess what? We're we're not all all are only different on the outside, but there's we're different from on the inside from a lot of people. They haven't been born again, and so guess what? We need to show care especially to those that have not been born again. To those that maybe have and they've fallen. Maybe those that have messed up. We need to show special care there. We can't let our disdain for ungodly deeds come through as disdain for ungodly people. They and we, in fact the Bible says such were some of you. Such was I. Amen. Amen. Some of you are shaking your head. You got testimony. You could tell us a lot of stuff that we'd probably be shocked right now. Guess what? Every one of us is only saved by the mercy and the goodness of God. And so we have to intentionally remember to care for those who haven't had that revelation yet, haven't come to that experience yet. Guess what? Sinners sin. It's what they do. So don't be shocked. Love them. Care for them. Amen. And, and don't be shocked. You know, people are going to do, do stuff. People's language may offend you. People, uh, you know, the, the guy that's, that, that's drunk and out of control, he, he, he was somebody's little boy. Maybe now he's, he reeks of alcohol and drugs and whatever. But guess what? He, he, he was somebody's little boy and was went to kindergarten and first grade and uh, starred in the 
school play at one time. And, you know, there, there's, there's a story there. Care for people. Care for people. Somebody's a little girl. Maybe now she's doing things in a plea for attention and caught in a web of lies. And, 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 but down deep, it's just a little girl who got off track. Amen. We must care especially about, about others. As God's people, you know, we try to live better and we try to, you know, surround ourselves with people who will help us and improve us and lift us. But we have to be careful that we don't pull away from people so much that we seem to be superior or anything like that. Don't fear being seen with people. Don't shun people. Don't love their activities and behaviors, but love them. Don't let them influence you. You influence them. Reach them. Care for them. Help meet their physical needs, spiritual needs. They're strangers, citizens of a different world. And so just some practical ways that we can do it. Maybe we could intentionally invite a stranger to our home. Maybe not a stranger like creepy serial killer type, but a stranger that you don't know. I mean, if that's the case, you might want to pray about that a little bit. But I'm not trying to be, I am being a little funny. You have to use wisdom and caution. Okay, but definitely invite somebody to church. Reach out to somebody. Take them out to eat. Practical ways to show people that you care for them, people that are not like you. Um, you know, offer to babysit their kids for a night out. Take them a, a pie. I love pie. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if there's anything that will distract me from teaching a good lesson, it's pie. Oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> invite them to go fishing or hunting or whatever that, that, that sounds good to you. Maybe give them the extra vegetables from your garden. Maybe invite them to a home group or a Bible study. Uh, maybe to come to church and offer to ride with you. Uh, and then when they come to church, offer to sit with you. Even if it means <gasps> not sitting in your favorite seat. <sighs> Mercy. You may have heard about the pastor who uh, kept saying, move over for guests and give them the best seats. And this one guy, he wouldn't move for nothing. So the pastor shot him. Nope, he didn't kill him, he just shot him, wounded him in the leg, and so he limped the rest of his life. And every time he would leave church, the pastor said, see that guy? He's the one that wouldn't move for the guest. So I'm just saying. <laughs> people, love people. Love people. Do people get annoyed at times? Yep. Do you get annoyed at times? Yep. Are they different from you? Yes. Are they taxing on our free time? Yes. But can I tell you, people who are not Christian, people who are not apostolic, they're not necessarily evil. They're just not. They're just people. Go find a prodigal. Go find the divorced, the lonely, the addicted, the refugee, the HIV patient, the poor, the orphans, the ones who need the gospel. We all need the gospel. And care, care is up to us. Care is something that it's not a collective emotion. It's, it can't be left to others or to the group as a whole. We have to do it ourselves. We have to, as an individual, we have to care. Of course, we care as, as a whole and some things that we do and participate in, but you have to care. Nothing, it, listen, it, caring is, the opposite of caring is to do nothing. Nothing never leads to anything good. Caring is taking the victim on horseback to the inn and, and doing like what the good Samaritan did. Amen. I'm coming to a close. C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screwtape Letters, writes about a conversation between Satan and his nephew, Wormwood, the apprentice devil. Okay, it's, a, it's just a book, okay? It's not the Bible. But anyway, it's a story. But it is interesting. It goes something like this. Satan tells Wormwood, his little evil nephew. Some of you may have had an evil nephew. Anyway, uh, 
He tells him, now your task is not to go out and make bad people. I'll take care of that. I'll supply the world with all kinds of evil, evil people to do evil things. But what I want you to do is just cause good people to do nothing. That's all you got to do. You just make all of your people comfortable, cause them to be content with things just as they are. Amen. Isn't that something? He, he, he goes on further to say, get their attention off whatever is important and keep them comfortable. Just keep good men doing nothing and I'll supply the world with evil men. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? Probably has done a good job. Amen. Stand with me tonight. Let me end this on a, uh, a bit of a positive note. I found a story about a man by the name of Henry Dunnett. He was born in 1828 in Switzerland. Wealthy parents. Had everything. He lived in luxury. But Dunnett was kind and caring. He visited the sick, helped those who were poor. As a young man, he established an organization in Switzerland called the Young Men's Christian Union, which was designed to help teenage boys. When he became an adult, he went into business on his own, did very well. One day he had an appointment with Napoleon III, whose armies were at war in Italy. He traveled to Italy to meet with Napoleon, but on his way, he passed all the battlefields, saw the atrocities of war and bayonets and guns just in the mud and so forth. He saw the bodies of 40,000 soldiers, most of them dead. Some of them, though, were still alive. He heard cries of agony and pain. Some were breathing their last breath. He couldn't turn away from that. So he went to the nearest town, persuaded the townspeople to turn the church into a first aid station. He persuaded citizens to help them. They took stretchers out into the battlefield, brought any wounded they could find back. They worked together uh, for some time, and they worked with doctors for three weeks, no sleep hardly, just ministering to people. He finally went home, but he never forgot what he had experienced. So he started writing to this nation and to that, to all inf influential people that he could. Finally, one day in Geneva, Switzerland, to an international gathering, he presented a resolution that we know today as the Geneva Convention. And this was signed by 22 nations granting immunity to doctors and ambulances and, and, and nurses so that they can go into the battlefield and help the wounded without fear of being shot at, ideally. And so they adopted as their symbol the red cross on a white background. And today, you know that symbol very well. Wherever there is war, floods, tornadoes, whatever, there's the red cross because one man, what did he do? He cared. Care. Amen. I want to tell you, church, caring may be perhaps one of the most Christ-like attitudes that we can have. We just can't not care. It's hard. <laughs> Sometimes you almost wish you could. Sometimes you kind of do, but you don't ever do it for long. If you've got the Spirit of God in you, you go right back to caring because that's just what we do. Let it be said of Solid Rock Church, those are some of the most caring people that I've ever known because it is an uncaring world. And so we need to get this phrase in our spirits, take care care of people. The Samaritan said, take care of him. We need to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of others. We need to take care of the church of God. Lord, tonight we thank you for the word. Thank you for this wonderful group of believers that love you and are here on a midweek, Lord, to study the word and have a true desire, Lord, to improve our spiritual uh, understanding and knowledge and implementation in our world. And really, I'm with a group of people that truly care. I thank you for them. They care about one another. They care about the work of God. They care about themselves and others. I'm praying that we could be a light and a witness to this world, that we could raise our families, Lord, to, to love and to care for not just one another, but for everybody. I pray that you would help us to never lose this very important 
characteristic that we get from you. You cared enough for us that you gave your life. And I pray that you would help us to give our life in the service of others. I thank you for it. I feel the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. Why don't we thank the Lord? Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for care. Thank you, Lord, for helping us. Help us, Lord, to remember how good you've been to us so that we can help other people. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. All right, God bless you. Y'all be careful and take care. I'll see you Sunday.